Once upon a time, a girl named Holly moved to a town called Hollywood. She had many adventures, and soon she began to write about them on a substack called Holly Wood, because she would. Then, she wondered what her friends and acquaintances were up to and how they lived their lives in this strange land, so she started this very podcast in order to find out. And now, you can too. Welcome to Hollywood. I just wanna, I just wanna, I just wanna get effed up and dance. This is our only chance. Happiness is fleeting. This feeling's way too good to live. Is Justin Warfield. He's a musician, a producer, songwriter, creator, prolific band member, solo artist, all the things. She's known very well for a band called She Wants Revenge. Hi. And <laughs> she does want revenge. No, she doesn't want revenge against you. No. Who wants revenge? Um, had never that name heard that question come up. <laughs> <laughs> the name came up because um, my bandmate Adam and I were sitting like at his like house making music, and we'd only made a couple of songs. This is now twenty years ago, which is so crazy. And uh, we were sitting there, and he's like, "We should like do this for real." Like I'm like, "Yeah." He's like, "We should like make this like a band." I'm like, "Cool." He's like, "We should come up with a name," and he goes, "You know, something like feminine, like." Like, girl revenge. And I was like, what about she wants revenge? I love it. It was literally that. It was probably a faster conversation than I told it. Yeah. Well, sorry to ask you. So I wrote it down on my <laughs> on the desk. Oh, it was in my house because I tagged the desk. And I was like, yeah, it looks good. The end. The and there end. you have it. Yeah. And that's the show. Um, <laughs> it's been really nice. Oh, thank it's been you nice. Having nice me. having you. <laughs> <laughs> so Justin and I have known each other for how like 17 years probably no no like well yeah i don't know i think i was like two <laughs> when i met you more really 18 yeah. years 23 i don't know whatever Something like that. we've known each other for a, a fuck of a long time i'm gonna say that it was 2005 yeah so yeah. i was 22 there you go so that's i was 19 not. years <laughs> <laughs> but i will say after all these years, yeah. we've been friends, we've worked together, yeah. you've taken my band on like a West Coast jaunt with your band, Fun. you've been a great supporter, but I don't know you that well. I know. So <laughs> you're like <laughs> an international man of mystery. Elusive. So I figured I'd invite you on yeah. so I could just really get to know you okay. in, in public. There on camera, because yeah. that's how we do it here we in Hollywood. <laughs> that's, how, <laughs> that's how we really do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I want to thank you for being, like, such a good friend and supporter over the years. Oh, thank you. And I was thinking about you are a great supporter of women in the music industry. Yeah. That's something I take super serious. Like, yeah. Like, very serious. Especially because, like, in Los Angeles, I feel the predatory nature of the music industry is akin to like, you know, a Greyhound stop where like, you know, a girl gets off the bus like with a backpack and like, you know, a bunch of dreams and like people descend on her like, yo, I'll produce you, like I'll write for you, like we should do this or like you're amazing. And that doesn't just happen like, like sexually, but also I feel like financially, there's like a whole industry that's super predatory that finds people that have these hopes and dreams and like, is like, I can, like this is the carrot being dangled. And so for me growing up in the industry um, and seeing like, you know, the weird power balances and just the way it was such a boys club, when I got to a point to where I was able to help other people, it just so happened that that women started coming to me. And so I made it a practice to let them know straight away, like, hey, like, I'm like your brother. Like, I'm like, you know, like, this is like a homie shit. And so like, um, I just became like that person. And also because like, you know, it's like, it's like the whole, like, if you like, if the door opens for you, you have to like hold it open for others, I feel. Yeah. And it's, it's tough for women in the music industry. I mean, it's tough for women everywhere, like <laughs> in Hollywood acting, everything. It's like, it's so like, you know, it's just not fair. Like, um, the way things are that, you know, a man can be like sort of dashing and like George Clooney gray, but like, if it's a woman, like she might not be on the call sheet, right? Like she might not be on the list for casting. So when it comes to the music side, 
for me, I'm like, I just want to be able to make music with women, help women find their voice, like anybody, like it, it could be a dude, it could be anybody, like, but it just so happens that like, there's like three or four women who I've worked with as an executive producer, as a producer, as like a big brother homie, as somebody that helps them basically um, speak for themselves. Yeah, you have always been like a really safe person in this town. And I have met a lot of people and a lot yeah. of dudes. And yeah. a, <laughs> I yeah. will say you are one of the few that has a very, very good record. <laughs> and we I actually have a personal story about that. So. <laughs> Because when I met you, I was just that was my next question. Do you remember how we met? I totally remember. Because I actually we should have had Tim Nordwind here. Don't this is crossover. fully remember. Okay, I, I do. Let's hear it. This could have been a crossover <laughs> episode. So we met at the Roosevelt Hotel. Okay. So if you go back and um, watch and listen to the Tim Nordwind, one of the sweetest humans on the planet, that episode. Shout out Tim. There is a lot of crossover there. Um, we met at the Holly Roosevelt. We actually met because of the gentleman who you were there with, who is the homie who you'd go travel with and hang out. Yes, in. he's yeah. mad at me right now. He who shall not be named. He shall not be named. Yeah. <laughs> who I totally love. But I met you with him and we hung out. And then I remember um, you said something like about like, I think you actually had a CD because that's how long ago it was. Yes, I probably was like carrying yeah. CDs in my bag. I think you were, <laughs> and you handed and you and you were like, "Yo, like it's you, like so, like you definitely had been drinking," and I was like <laughs> sober. <laughs> and and at one point you said, um, "You were like, yeah, like like I'm looking for a producer, maybe," and I was just like, "Yeah, like." No, <laughs> but it's because like we were at a club, like we were flirting, we were hanging out. So like, I just have a real line where I'm just like, yeah, yeah no, like, yeah, there's definitely lots of people you can meet who will <laughs> make music with you. <laughs> and then we did end up working together many years later. Right. Under totally different. <laughs> well, not just, yeah, that was amazing, but not just that also with child yeah which yeah. I found like a text thread where I was like looking for some like search word to find like something in my like iPhone and I just was typing in and a like super old conversation came up and it was about the recording sessions where like I came in and like was sort of just like giving ideas and guidance and notes when yeah. you were working on that stuff and it was something about like Holly loves the tunes and what you did. She like <laughs> put some pianos on it or whatever. And I was like, cool. And I was like, oh, that was fun. And it was literally like two days ago. So it really brought me full circle because I forgot that we did that stuff. I, yeah, I know. I really was like thinking about our long yeah. uh, friendship and like how much we actually have done together and collaborated over the years. When yeah. do you think you met Justin? I mean, I believe that story <laughs> at the Roosevelt. That makes sense. I mean, bungalow. I kind of remember like just the time, like that time and knowing you and seeing you around. And it was actually like right before She Wants Revenge, like blew the fuck up. Because yeah. I remember like knowing you and then all of a sudden you were like yeah in ma major. And, and I also remember <laughs> you were sober and I was super not yeah <laughs> and well, being like yeah. Ooh, like scared to hang out with somebody totally who is sober how long have you been sober now um this month it'll be 25 years wow yeah it's pretty congratulations crazy. thank you wait this is month february is my birthday too yeah. february 22nd is that Sobs or California Sober? California Sobs. <laughs> it's working for me, okay? Whatever it's works working. for you. It looks good on you. You're doing so good that whatever you're doing, I, like, seriously. Thank um, you. But, yeah, like, you know, it's, I just feel like, um, you know, because in, in, in watching and listening to your podcast and what you, what you all do and thinking about this town, I was like, oh man, like, I hate talking about Hollywood, like, because I'm from here, you know? <laughs> and I was like, what is that conversation? And organically, this comes up. And it's like, I believe that you never know why someone comes into your life, right? You never know that if like, you meet somebody, you may think that it's for work, and it ends up that you help them in some other way, or they help you. And if you truly it's gonna sound so like, whatever, like, so like new age, but like, if you really believe that like the purpose of life, which I do is to give and receive love and just to like experience relationships with other people. 
and just leave a positive impact and do more good than harm, then like it's that thing where people say like some award show somebody was like saying something the other day. Oh, it was um that comedian and that woman who's so amazing on the bear in her in her acceptance speech, she said, thank you to all the assistants of the agents who like deal with my long emails, my crazy emails. And like, I always believe that, that like you never know who you meet in your life, how they're going to affect your life. So you just got to be kind and cool. And so the fact that we like met, like when I was probably like, I, not probably, I was in that very like Cobra snake phase of like American apparel <laughs> underwear with like boots walking around like the Roosevelt, like just some just, oh, so like, just, we it was so bad, you know, like the indie sleaze of it all, right? Yeah. And, and then we meet and then all these years later and making music and reading your writing and, and being able to be an early person that's like, yo, like you're an amazing writer. Like this is your thing. Like you were trying to do this other stuff, but this is your jam. And so. Justin. No, thank you're you. a dope writer. Thanks for skipping. Yeah. You're, okay, we're supposed to be talking about you. I don't Thank like talking you. about me. <laughs> I know. I love how you keep turning this around. Yeah. It's your pod. <laughs> I want to, like, uh, okay, I know right. you don't want to talk about Hollywood, but I actually, I only just recently found out, I guess maybe I didn't know this. I don't mm. know if I knew this. Your dad is in the industry. Yeah, What yeah. is your dad? Well, he's not, do? well, you he's in up. A industry. Yeah. Like so, like I'm not a nepo baby, was, but I'm I'm pretty <laughs> nepo adjacent. Because I'm a nepo baby. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I like. So it, I yeah. thought maybe we could be yeah. in the club together. Yeah, no, I mean <laughs> I'm probably like let's put it this way: like if you like are from like Idaho or like whatever, and you like come to LA and you're like, how do I make it? And you're like a screenwriter at like Starbucks with their laptop open, or whether you're like running around with your modeling book, you're like, your headshot, like, then for sure I would be considered a Nepo baby. But by the standards of the world I grew up in, like, they're like, your family's not famous. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, because I grew up in a crazy world. What is the world? Um, my dad is from uh, South Central Los Angeles. My mom's from Brooklyn, New York. Um, they both ended up in um, Los Angeles. Well, my dad... They ended up at LA Valley College in the 60s as two hippies that met. They hooked up, started dating, got an apartment in Hollywood um, up above the former 101 Cafe in the Clark Street Diner up Vista Del Mar. And that street was called Hippie Hill. And it was just like everybody like would just go from house to house, like listening to like Joni Mitchell records and like smoking weed. And it was just like, it, you know, it was 67, Summer Love. And they would like go see Santana or Janis Joplin at the Bowl and like, you know, do acid and like, that it was like that. So fun. And so he <laughs> wanted to be an actor, right? And he was a theater guy cause his dad was a theater guy. And then he ended up a, a tour guide at Universal Studios tour. And then somebody was like, when he decided to have a kid, they were like, you kind of need a real job. And he had done like a couple of like movies, like oh no, one movie, like this amazing exploitation movie called The Pink Angels about a gay um, hardcore, 1% motorcycle gang <laughs> that encounters some really serious bikers on the way to a drag ball. Real true story. Oh, wow. And um, I need to see that. It's epic. Yeah. It's epic. I have the one sheet posters and everything, and it's incredible. Um, and so he was like an actor, and then he did a bunch of like black television in the 70s, but like there wasn't a lot of space for black actors in the 70s. You had like two or three roles you could play. And so he played like a Black Panther on one TV show and he played a couple of other roles. And then they were like, let's have a kid. And he's like, I need a real job. So somebody was like, hey, I'll get you a job in the um, mail room of the music industry. Like there's this record company putting out this new artist, Barry White, blah, blah, blah. So he worked in the mail room and then Barry White was like, you seem cool. You want to help me promote my record? And then he promoted Barry White's first records. And then like he went on to just have a 25 to 30 year career in the music industry doing what at the time what we called black radio promotions so luther vandross tina marie michael jackson earth wind and fire like all of the sort of greats of that era and so i had a lot of access to that kind of world wow that's so cool yeah which is crazy um but if I like look at the Nepo baby scale. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel the same way. Like, 
yes, I'm a Nepo baby, but then I also like grew up in Minnesota. So it sort of like cancels out some or of it. Or maybe it makes you super Nepo baby because <laughs> in Minnesota there aren't other Nepo babies. Well, that always was weird. I was always like mad at my parents. Like, why do we live here? I felt like such an outcast. Yeah. Like everybody at school wanted to come over to just meet my dad. I was really? like on That's display. So cool. <laughs> I was like modeling and shit. And it was just weird. It was unheard of. Everything yeah. I was doing. So read the sub stack. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought it would have been better to grow up here. I don't know. I think it gives you a unique, unique perspective for sure. Did you like growing up here? Yeah, I can't imagine having grown up any other place. Um, I only really function on the coast in a very yeah. sort of Woody Allen way. I know you're not supposed to talk about that, but whatever. <laughs> um, so I lived in London for years, and I um, I did a little short spell um, when I was living in New York with you know Jamie. Yeah. When we lived together in New York, and um, but I'm like a total LA baby. I grew up in the Valley, which is a little bit different because like so many of my friends were like very famous sons and daughters of, and that wasn't how I grew up. That's like my like later teenage years when I, so like, it's interesting that my formative years were in the Valley and it was a very like idyllic suburban Valley setting. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, fucking Brady Bunch. You know, I literally grew up like a couple of like, you know, quarter of a mile from the Brady Bunch like house. The actual Brady the actual Bunch, Brady Bunch the house. TV family. Yeah, like Studio City. <laughs> yeah. So like I grew up in like a Studio City suburb of like mostly like working class, you know, families. Um, and it wasn't until I was about 14 or 15 that like I became a total Hollywood brat. And like because I'm 50, that was the time of like Corey Haim, Corey Feldman. Like So you were like running around with the Corys and No. <laughs> but but you know, like real talk, like when I was 12, I would have been stoked to have hung out with Corey. <laughs> like, what were you, who were you running? What were you doing? That was like Hollywood brat. Well, my first like exposure to Hollywood was I like, come over to like Hollywood Boulevard because there's a bunch of music magazines and my dad would bring me over here and to radio stations in Hollywood. And like K Day was this radio station that like really first started playing hip hop. I like, remember K Day. Yeah. yeah. And so that was in Echo Park. And so I, I would come over the hill, come to Hollywood. But once I like started running around with Hollywood kids, it was like mostly people that lived over like Bel Air or like on the West side and some people that lived in Hollywood and we would just like run wild. There was this teen club that <laughs> this person started. <laughs> this is so dark. <clears throat> there was a teen club for kids that like basically made for like child actors to go so that like they could have a safe place yeah. and, like, where they could get in. Right. But also like looking back, it's pretty chicken hockey. <laughs> yeah. So like it was called, it was called Alfie soda pop club. Or Alpi Soda Club, right? Okay. And it was sponsored by New York Seltzer because you couldn't drink, right? Yeah. So it was like in all those Teen Beat magazines and everything, which <laughs> I don't know because I never had any, but people would tell me and show me. And so it was like all the teen actors of the day would go there. And it was like we would just go because like they would let us get in the booth and like put on records and like rap and like hang out and dance. And that was a place to meet girls when I was 15. And so, like, going to first clubs at 15 is pretty Hollywood, baby. And then the transition to, like, Bold House clubs and everything yeah. <laughs> everything that happened at a very early age. So did I like growing up in L.A.? Absolutely. But I'm really glad that I had a suburban grounding mm -hmm. in the Valley and that experience. And also, like, where else could I have a grandparent that, like, lives in South Central by the Coliseum and also a grandparent that has a condo in Malibu? and bounce between both worlds. And so yeah. my entire being is sort of a very mixed, very, very Angelino trip. <laughs> yeah, that's very LA. Yeah. And so you grew up like seeing fame and famous people. How do you feel about fame? What do you think about celebrity? That's a pretty deep question. Last night I was talking about somebody um, with a dear friend at this party we threw. And I said, I think that um, fame just makes you more of who you are. Interesting. And so that's the first thing that came to mind. Yeah. Um, I think that if you have a grounding and you, you, you know who you are that, I don't know, like for me, um, I know like a lot of people grow up and they like want to be famous. I didn't want to be famous. I wanted to be like the people that I admired. Right. And they happen to be famous, right? Right. So at one point that might have been, you know, Jimi Hendrix or Jim Morrison, or that might have been, 
you know, Gus Van Sant, or that might have been John Taylor from Duran Duran, or Prince, or Madonna. Like, it wasn't the the, the lifestyle or the um, creature comforts afforded them by being celebrities or famous. It was the fact that they were doing something of value and worth that impacted the culture and and was feeding me as a kid. Run DMC, like the Beastie Boys. If those people didn't come into my life, um, I just don't know where I would be. So for me, like somebody said, Reese, like I have, I'm, I have a son, like, you know, like Bowie. Yeah. So as a dad, as a, as a father of a 16 year old, you know, teenager, who's a filmmaking student, <clears throat> I joke with them. I'm like, you're the real Napo baby. Cause like, <laughs> my dad worked behind the scenes. And so I would go to Barry White's house in Encino or Tarzan or whatever. And I would go to the like world premiere of thriller and like, hang out the Jackson crib with like all the Jacksons and be like, Oh my God, Janet's so cute. And like, I had this crazy lifestyle, but my dad was like the dude who everybody loved who was behind the scenes. And the difference between that and like, even though I'm like a very, very, very minor public figure because of my band, um, I'm like, I, I think that I have more direct access. And so I, the great joy of my life now is being able to afford my son opportunities and experiences as a result of the things that I'm afforded because of the music that I put out and the things I've done, which has given me a platform or a voice or access so that like certain ropes open. Yeah. And as long as he maintains the incredible work ethic and humility that he has, then I, he, that's great to be like, have a leg up. Like, yeah. Your kid is amazing. Thank you. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Bowie. A lot of people are now. He's really like, <laughs> honestly, like low key. It's weird when you're like, yo, like I wish I was this kid. Like he's just so he's much so cooler. Cool, <laughs> like the style, like yeah, all of it. He's just smart. He's outgoing. He's just cool. He has a job now. It's crazy. <laughs> he does. Oh yeah, like it's it's nuts. But so like yeah, like I think that your and my sort of periphery to the Nepo baby thing is probably pretty similar and similar experiences. But the way I look at it is like, I don't know. It's just like, it's fun. Like yeah. if you literally, like if you're a teamster and you're in like New Jersey and like you're working a job and whatever, you know, unionized thing, like you're going to get your brother-in-law in the union faster than yeah. some like mook that comes off the streets. Yeah. If you open a restaurant somewhere and your sister-in-law wants to be the host, you're going to look at, at them before you are some stranger. Same with like nepotism is unavoidable. Doctors, and everything, all of it. Right. Yeah. I and mean, I think a lot of nepotism is like, you know, you grow up, you, you don't have, maybe you don't have anyone in your family or you don't know anyone directly who's famous and it seems right. really inaccessible. Right. But when you grow up in it, like you are like, oh, I can do that too. And I think that's, that's the huge. biggest part of nepotism. That's amazing. I've never thought about it like that because I know for a fact that everything in my life um, that I've achieved is because I never had a doubt that I could, mm -hmm. right? So whether Same. that, so, right? Yeah. <laughs> so whether that's you know getting and staying sober, right? Seeing someone else do it and going like, oh, well, I could do that because there's a way, there's a path. If you do this, and these, if you do these steps, and these results will happen. And when, when I, you know, saw musicians like Prince like sit in a room and like make all the music on his own, or when I would hear anybody. I'm like, it's possible. And if you know somebody that does it, to your point, right, then you're yeah. like, oh, this. So, yeah, growing up in the world that I grew up in, like, my first producer was Quincy Jones the third. Like, he goes by QD3. Um, and he's Quincy Jones' son. And people are like, oh, like, you must have had an amazing life growing up Quincy Jones' son. And he grew up in Sweden. He didn't grow up with his dad. Yeah. He moved to L.A. and moved into, like, Bel Air with his dad. Um when he was probably like 19. And so he he learned how to hone his craft as a producer and musician and um, artist in his bedroom in, in Sweden. Like, and then he came here and doors opened for him, A, because he was dope and because of his dad. And so 
I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, yeah. Hollywood's, I mean, it can go both ways too. I know, all know plenty of a rock yeah. star's child that is very crippled by. Oh man, that must be tough. By living under that shadow, or you know, or just having like the tr endless trust fund that just kills so many people. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine because I definitely grew up very, very middle class, and like you know, would I wasn't somebody who I went to private schools, but like. I was on like, you know, like a financial aid kid. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm proud of that. You know what I mean? It's like, my parents wanted me to go to good schools, but it w didn't come without sacrifice or like help from my grandpa. So when people are like, where'd you go to school? And I tell them, they're like, oh, and they roll their eyes and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like yo. It's like, not like that, it's not like that, I swear. I mean, it's half like that. <laughs> <laughs> was it always music for you? Was that always no. your, what else? Like, how did it? Yeah, I didn't, the... I never wanted to be a musician. What? Yeah. Okay, you back me up. Yeah. <laughs> Start at the beginning. Yeah. What was the plan? Um, my earliest desire was to be a filmmaker, and oh. it still is. I'm just like a, like a frustrated writer and director, or like who's been stuck in a music career for 34 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so what happened is my mom, like my dad was making music, and my mom was like, like read everything, like she was very literate and like a lot of amazing books around, a lot of amazing movies. I mean, I remember like some of my first movie I, like experiences were like, you know, Manhattan or Annie Hall or like um, Harold and Maude and like, you know, it wasn't like Star Wars. And I mean, it was, cause I grew up in that era, but oh. it was definitely independent film. I've never seen Star Wars. You've never seen Star Wars? I've never That's seen so Star tight. Wars. That's I'm amazing. Every, everyone's going to be really mad at me. That's so dope. I had to say it. I had to admit it. Oh, okay, no, that's go great. on, go on. That's amazing. <laughs> I've met somebody who said that before. That's also like a good party trick to break out. I've never seen Star like, Wars. Like, I've never seen Star Wars. <laughs> like, people are all like, the best party trick is the word. You know, immediately know the worst person is if they're like, Beatles suck. <laughs> Like if somebody talks shit <laughs> about the Beatles. How did anybody actually say the Beatles suck? Because it's, just a, like, it's like a contrarian party trick. So boring. Um, so okay. yeah, I just wanted to be a director. I just wanted to make films. And so I was going to go to film school. I was going to go to UCLA film school with my buddy. Like everything was like writing scripts. Like when I was like 14, I started writing spec scripts and like writing things. Like when I went to, I didn't go to college. I went to where my parents went, LA Valley College for one semester. And I dropped out because I got a record deal. Um, but like, I remember for an English assignment, I wrote a sample spec episode of A Different World. If you remember that show. I forgot what that is. It was like um, Lisa Bonet's like um. Um, main show that was like Cree Summer. And like, it's one of the defining black television shows of the 80s. It's like, it is everything. Like, I it's just hard to describe. Young. Yeah, no, you're way too young. But like a different <laughs> world, like it's the cultural impact is massive. And so I wrote a spec episode just for my English class. And the premise actually was later used in an episode. No one saw it. It's just like I was tuned into like what that sort of yeah. the storyline and the plot points. And so I started writing pretty early and high school just wanted to make film. I went to I graduated from a very small high school. It was like mostly actors and I had no desire to act like I hate being on camera, but I was like, I want to tell stories. Um, I knew I was a writer very early on and that was my first love. I knew I didn't want to just do novels. I knew it was going to be cinematic. So when I ended up making records, I started as a hip hop artist. I started doing that, putting out records, living in the hip hop world and like, you know, from basically 89 through 92. Did that start because of writing? Like, yeah. Yeah, I did. I mean, I, I really love. You just were so into music. You I was so into music, and I just loved the lyricism of hip hop. And it was like my punk rock for my generation. And I was like, this is it. And so I was writing raps, and a friend of mine like found a piece of paper, scribbled on the bar at my parents' house. He's like, what's this? And he read it, and he's like, this is really dope. And he's like, you write this? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, can you rap it for me? And I did. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I'm going to bring you to my producer's house. And that was Quincy Jones's house. Wow. And so when I was 15, before I could drive, 14 and 15, we started working together. And when I was 16, we put out for my first single. And so it all started from like, just like the pen and writing and loving that. Mm -hmm. But I was like, this is cute. But like, I want to make movies. Yeah, this is not I'm what I'm really doing. <laughs> yeah, no, it didn't feel it didn't feel like something, you know, 
and my dad was in the music industry and so I was like I don't want to do that I felt the same way yeah. I was like into writing and right. like you were into writing back then I was into writing yeah I thought I was gonna like go to school for journalism or something do you have your writing I'm a back writer then? I have some of it I have some like really bad poetry of you and do. you know yeah <laughs> I have a lot of like journal entries and stuff I was always sort of like recording yeah. things but oh, I thought cool. yeah my dad's in the music industry yeah Blech, lame yeah. like especially like pop and rock and stuff mm -hmm. I was like maybe classical music was cool yeah <laughs> were you going to clubs like um like to see shows yeah I started going to clubs to see shows when I was like 13 like 7th Street entry first half oh my god that's so epic yeah I remember yeah. seeing like space hog <laughs> really <laughs> and like tripping out and like being so Brooke upset was talking about and space in love hog with them <laughs> Brooke and Elliot were talking about space hog the other day and I'm like, you <laughs> and then coming to LA and then meeting them and being like oh my god <laughs> see that must be weird see that's something that I don't have so because you're not from here right um meeting people who you admire that was probably something that was like whoa, like I'm standing next to this person and I'm having a conversation. It was a little more exciting, but I still felt like not fully like impressed because right. I did I did meet people through my dad. And totally. I would, you know, he toured with like Sheryl Crow and there were yeah. people around big, you know, Minnesota artists. Yeah. Prince. Yeah. I got to meet all those people. You so. met Prince? Yeah. Far out. A couple times. <laughs> he tried to, um, he tried to pull a date that I was having dinner with um, at a nightclub once <laughs> in the 90s. Actually, I was at Teddy's mm -hmm. in like, I don't know, 2007 or something. I was like dancing and this big guy comes up to me, a bodyguard. Of course. And he's like, hey, Prince wants to meet you. Yeah. And so he like brings me over and I like danced with Prince for a minute and it was That's really awkward. And incredible. then I was like, you that know dance. my dad, my <laughs> Michael Bland plays in my dad's band, one of my dad's bands. Whoa. So then he sort of was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> weirded out. Cool. I was like, I met you when I was like five. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> definitely going to kill the vibe. Yeah, it killed the vibe. Were you attracted to Prince? No. No. I wouldn't be either. Sorry. I <clears throat> love him, though. I love him, but like, <clears throat> I don't want to go there with like such a huge legend. No, you got to aim lower. <laughs> <laughs> You've it's been there. With a huge legend like that? No. Maybe? Mm, I don't know. I can't think of any. Read the substack. <laughs> read the substack. I don't know. Read my, yeah, read my substack tomorrow. <laughs> so I was at the Roxbury. Yeah. Like made famous by night at the Roxbury. And I was sitting there like one of the like prime booths um, having dinner. Because, like, nobody knows, but they had, like, the best fried chicken in town at the time. And so I would go there. <laughs> and I, like, brought this girl who I don't even remember. And it was, like, a first date. And, like, it was, like, you know, I'm, like, 17. But, like, they gave me a table because I know the people who are in the yeah. club. And I'm, like, sitting there, like, flexing. And got this, like, older woman sitting with me, like, hanging out, having dinner and drinks. And this guy comes over. He's, like, excuse me. And he's, like, Prince would like you to join him at his table right there. And he didn't even look at me. just looked at her. And I was like, at dinner, at that's dinner. rough, man. Across the table from me. He was directly across. Prince was sitting there. And he's like, Prince would like you to join up for dinner. Didn't even make eye contact <laughs> with me. And I just did like, uh, hey, tell him to go fuck himself. You weren't like, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was like, I'm like. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah, fuck that. You don't get to do that. No way. No. We love you, Prince, but no. <laughs> no, I mean, but it was exciting. Yeah. Because I had a cutout of him on his purple motorcycle <laughs> for that I got from the local video store in North Hollywood. So I was like, yeah, I got to say no to Prince. Yeah. And you're like, she's my girl. Yeah. <laughs> the girl is mine. Um throw it back to Michael Jackson but yeah um I don't know it's all weird so okay so when she wants revenge yeah. like just exploded yeah did you feel famous like did your life change it was in a totally huge weird. way it was super weird because I was because I got a record deal when I was 16 mm -hmm. <clears throat> like I was around the proximity to like greatness and life-changing moments was insane like my teen years were like what the Woodstock generation had with like, you know, 
the insane 60s artists. For me, it was like 1991, 1992, and I'm hanging out with like everyone that mattered in hip hop and friends with them, smoking and drinking with them, running around New York City. Like I was like Henry Hill and Goodfellas, and they let me into the Copacabana, <laughs> and I was a kid hanging out with De La Soul, Tribe Called Quest, Black Sheep, Brand Nubian, um, everybody you can think of, Latifah, like anybody who mattered in that time, Boogie Down Productions, like everybody. I knew and was around, and so I was just, I was known because I had a single out and it was on the radio, so like people knew me and accepted me in as one of their own. Then I came back to LA and I was just like Justin from LA. And because, <laughs> because the club scene is so is so prevalent, there's like the Far Side House of Pain, all these Los Angeles groups, um, the Black Eyed Peas later before they became the Black Eyed Peas. Will is somebody who's an old friend who was like, influenced by my rap like and he told me that recently i was like it's crazy and he's like you he actually said to me he said i knew it was possible when i heard you on the radio which is i'm like dude you could go to like the moon if you want like you're like literally like backed by nasa and he said that so that's cool but i had all this access but it was like local and it was like you know what it's like in a small town i always say la is like a super small town yes. it's like a midwest town because everybody knows everybody and every time i see somebody i know them i'm like did we go to high school together? Did we date? Do I know you from like like a twelve step room? Yeah, like, because yeah. everybody knows everybody. But when that song blew up after like you know a year plus of touring and grinding it out and doing that, it was crazy because we were opening up for Block Party where no one knew us. Two thousand five, full peak, you know, Cobra Snake, Indie Sleaze, like the great you know American Apparel, like that era of just madness. And I was 30, I think, which is an interesting time and, and a change uh, where your life sort of, you know, you're sort of, you're changing. You're going, you're, you're like, somebody said to me the other day that two days ago, somebody said to me the most profound thing. I hope I don't mess this up. He said, when you turn 30, you're really just starting to work through all the bad shit that happened to you in your 20s. And I was like, whoa. Like, he didn't say it, like, in those words, but that yeah. was the gist of it. Yeah. And so when I turned 30, I was like, okay, like, my life is getting good now, and I'm making music that I like. Previous to that, I was, like, doing wardrobe and styling, and I was a stylist assistant and casting assistant, and I just, like, art department, just, like, total blue-collar job guy, obviously in a cool industry but yeah. like punching a clock and like oh you took out this much from my paycheck and like you know mm -hmm. living in a little apartment like by myself and in the valley and like I wrote a script and I was trying to um make this movie and our friend Yossi you remember Yossi no you don't remember Yossi? sorry yeah. sorry Yossi <laughs> Yossi's the person who commissioned the Shepherd Ferry uh, Obama poster, the Hope poster. I mean, that name sounds familiar. Yeah, so Yossi was like somebody that like campaigned for Obama, then later worked in the White House. But when I knew him, he was like a kid I met yeah. on Suicide Girls. Yeah. Like, <laughs> who like, he was like, I'm a film producer. And I was like, cool. And he took my script out and we were making an indie movie. And I was just going to make this movie. And we had financiers and doing the whole dance around town. And I was going to make this movie. And then our music got in the hands of some people. We got offered a record deal. I had to go. Wow. Wow. And so I was like, okay. And like, and that was my third record deal. She um was she wants revenge. So I was like, okay, like I'll step up to the plate one more time. Like let's see what happens. Yeah. Like I had already lived in London with a record deal. I'd already got signed to Warner Brothers through Quincy Jones when I was a kid. And I'm like, I mean, okay, cool. Like I'll put out some songs. They'll drop us in two years. I'll mm -hmm. make my movie. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like yeah. the cycle. Totally. <laughs> and to then cut to 2006 and like walking down the street and literally like every day cars driving by and hearing my song was something that I wasn't really prepared for. Yeah. Um, and it was so gratifying and it was so weird and it just felt like bonus round. It felt like this is cool. Cause I thought I was pretty done and washed with music. So I was like, this is incredible. It seems like there's something to that, like letting go of the expectations or the or the neediness or desperation where you're just like, eh, whatever, I'll just see what happens. And that's yeah. usually when things totally. hit. Yeah. And from a song that I would have, you know, pulled off the record in favor of another one that I like that no one thought was going to be a hit. So what did it feel like? Like, because like, right around before like by the time the record came out i had already like met my wife mm -hmm. and was in a serious relationship and was sober and so i got to experience the um 
the recognizability or the the small bit of fame or celebrity out of that through like in sort of a right sized and healthy way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so the entire time that I've been known as she wants revenge, um, I've been married like, and in a relationship and so, and sober. So it's <laughs> definitely a different experience than a lot of people who like, yo, you're the bit like, if you're the biggest band in your town and you're, you know, from Akron, it's like one thing. If you're the biggest band in LA and you're from Hollywood, that's crazy. And so like, it was amazing. Like doing the in-store at Amoeba Records where we signed records and um, and performed. I mean, there was 2000 people around the block, like all the way around like the arc light. And that was like the greatest feeling or like the fact that we started at um, the Dragonfly and then Cinespace and then the Silver Lake Lounge and then Spaceland and then the Troubadour and then the El Rey and then Two Nights at the Fonda, Two Nights at the Wiltern, Lollapalooza, uh, headline the Greek or co-headline the Greek and then headline the outdoor theater at Coachella. Like for a dude that literally would be like in bands for years being like, okay, let's all put in our 20 bucks for the rehearsal room yeah. with a broken air conditioner. And yeah. you know what I mean? That smells like beer. And like, I, I really appreciated it. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. I really appreciated it. So like being at like the Grove or the Americana and having somebody come up and ask for an autograph or take a picture it wasn't like I'm famous. It was like, I can't believe so many people know my music. Yeah. You're just stoked. Yeah. I mean, also it's you're still like that. in your twenties or you're partying. It's you, you get that kind of success. You often die. So yeah. it's great when totally. it happens to somebody who's a little older and has a little life under their belt and yeah. has found themselves in a more stable place. I definitely would have died if it had worked out for me the way I wanted yeah. in my 20s I, I think so too like I never thought I was gonna make it to 27 like I was Same. definitely arrogant enough to think that like being a J that I was gonna enter that club <laughs> <laughs> what uh what got you sober um how old were you I was I was 25 and I was um and so then like two months later, I turned 26. So really close to 26. And it was just like bad. And it had been bad for a long time. But I guess just like willingness and like, like, like you said about giving up, like once you give up, like the fight for something that you want, like you often get it. Yeah. Like um, probably like that. I just gave up. I was like, I'm done. Like I was living in London and it was dark. I think the actual reason why I got sober is because um, – I'm a really neurotic person. And even though I like can project a pretty laid back and cool sort of thing, like I am very, very, very confident. Um, but I'm also deeply neurotic. And so I wasn't the type of um, drug addict who did so with reckless abandon and like, fuck it, fuck the world. It's Same. all good. I was such a, I was so like funny. nervous I and sketchy. I wrote and, about that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like I'm on Molly and I'm still like worried about everything around me. <laughs> Like, I can't ever just relax into anything. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't experience that. I felt pretty fucking relaxed. I mean, although I'm too old, so we didn't call it Molly back then. But um, I never had that I don't care. Like, I had actions and behaviors that definitely signaled I don't care if I live or die. Mm -hmm. But I actually did. And that's the sort of pull, right? A lot of people I know were like hope to die addicts. I wasn't like, I was like super like, it was like Larry David with like <laughs> an Altoids box full of drugs. Like it's, yeah. it's like, it's like, uh, and it's just like this and that and like this. And it's just, but like at one point I started to be like fearless and that fearlessness is actually, I think coupled with like a moment of clarity and some sort of grace allowed me to get sober and clean. But definitely being fearless scared the shit out of me because I was like, wait, I have I like now I feel like fuck it where mm. I never felt like fuck it. And that's terrifying because then I knew the consequences. And also, like, I went to the doctor and he's like, you're going to die. And I was like, oh, wow. And I got arrested in London. Like, and that was the first time I ever had a consequence. And I was like, wait, like, I don't get caught. Like, oh, I get pulled arrested? over by LAPD and I got like <laughs> a trunk full of this and that. And like, I skate and I was like, I got arrested and I was like wow, like, 
this was not like on the bingo card, as people say. Yeah. Like I was she like, was this is real. this doesn't happen to me. Like I get through everything, and mm-hmm. I just stopped. I just got really sloppy. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like the third act of a movie where like the guy gets caught. It's like you know. I've had those moments when I was like getting into heroin, where I was like sort of saw myself from above, where I was like. Even for you, this is too dark. You've crossed the line. Do you consider yourself a dark person when you're in that place? When you say even for you, did you consider yourself a dark person then? Yeah, I considered myself a dark person all the way until I was 35 and fell and flat on my face and broke my face and wow. really had to face the consequences yeah. of 20 years of like chaos. 20 years? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 15 to 35. See, my, like, my using was Falls to long. the wall. <laughs> I packed it into a much shorter time, and I did get sober young, too. Right? Yeah. So That's so lucky yeah. that you were able to I think catch it's more yourself. Like ni- I think it's more like 19 to 25, almost 26. That's quick. It's really quick, and it was really hard, and it was really scary. Actually, like we threw this club last night. I was talking to a friend, and he had, like, a blur button. He had, like, 100 buttons. You know Morty. He had, like, 100 yeah. buttons on his jacket, but, like, one of them was Blur, and I'm like, oh, you like Blur? We started talking about Britpop, and I was he didn't know that I lived in London at the peak of that. And so we were recounting all those stories, and then it went into, you know, crazy. Like, And he didn't really know my story, and he was just sort of like slack-jawed and like, holy shit. And, um, <laughs> and it was like super fun and glamorous and epic until it was just super lonely and boring and scary and yeah. like mundane and, and bad. And like, I don't know. But like... The thing I really want to talk about is like how super awkward it is that um, there's a portion of this talk where I'm like, we're talking about being a safe space for women and how like cringe that feels to have said anything like that out loud. <laughs> 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 like, it's just like, there's my neurosis on full display. Like, I'm like, this is super dope. We're having a great conversation. Like, you're like not like some dude that like is in the business of like helping women. Like, like it just sounds so dumb. <laughs> Like, it's just so, like... No, but I'm the one that brought it up. I know, but, like, I it's brought so, it up like... Because you really are. Like, I have met and worked with so many dudes yeah. in this industry. And I really was thinking about it the last couple of days, like, sort of prepping for this conversation and being like, wait, Justin's, like, actually probably, like, the safest dude in the music industry that I've ever that, experienced. Yeah. I mean, I, of course, I've met a couple great yeah. ones. But yeah. it's there's... It's not so good. Yeah. It's not good. I know. And film's probably even worse. It, I guess it's just that, like, when you <laughs> said that, I felt that's, like, the coolest thing that anybody could ever say to me. Like, if somebody said, I love your music or your music, like, got me through a hard time or all these things that are really, that's, like, um, that's not in my control. Yeah. If I write lyrics that, like, keep somebody, like, that get, help somebody get through a breakup or a death... I'm powerless over that. I just happen to write that. But I am, um, I do have um, the choice to live a certain way. And I do have a choice to behave a certain way. And so you saying it out loud, it just felt like really good because like we know how many creeps there are and how gnarly people are. And so like I don't wear it as a badge of honor, but I also, um, I just don't want people to be uncomfortable around me in any way like whether it's my moodiness which i'm like super moody and like have to work on like being the person that walks in the room and they're like damn like he's in a bad mood like, i don't you know or whether you know a 21 year old girl is like hey like here's what i want to do with my music and can you help me for me i'm not like well hey like i'm the safe dude let me talk to you i'm just like yeah. I'm, my main thing and when i say safety is more like Every woman I've ever made music with has had experiences of men telling them how to make music or what their music should be like or what they should sing like, what they should write about, the kind of tracks they should have, the kind of band they should have, the way they should look, the way they should dress, everything. everything. It's insane. So what I've tried to do is when I work with somebody, regardless of gender, is witness who they are and what they want to be and become and support that rather than impart my idea of that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that that's the cool part of working with young people is 
there's so much potential and there's so many people that are like, come on kid, I got this. And especially like, because I actually sit there and make music in a physical way as an engineer producer, there's so many times where like, like somebody in a studio goes, what are you doing? What, what is that you're doing? And they ask a technical question. And I've worked with so many people that are women who say, oh, when I usually ask something, people are like, don't worry about it. I'm like, that's crazy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just like, it's like a sit there and look pretty kind of thing. And like, I'm going to make your music. And so I appreciate you saying that. And I was obsessing over the fact that I was like, oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just not the dude hanging out at the Greyhounds, like, you know, sitting on top of a caddy being like, hey, come here. You want to be famous? I'm like, try to be the opposite. Right. You know, in a town full of just. Do you think things minutes, are. Sorry. Sorry. Just a five minute. Five warning. minute warning. Oh, shit. And really? It's, it's right Already? Too. God, I was going to say, Couple like, do you think boxes. things are are changing? Like, do you think the younger generation is going to be cooler when it comes sure. to this shit i mean you have a kid yeah. that age and mm -hmm. and as far as even like drugs and alcohol it seems like that stuff isn't cool anymore like none of it okay or, so i like, don't know maybe that's just wishful no thinking. no or i it's think it's cooler to be clean i think that it's i think that for my generation there were no role models who just had their shit together it was like, whether it's like Jeff Spicoli or Cheech and Chong, or whether it's like, you know, um, every artist that we saw who was just like, look like a hard drinking, like Chrissy Hine to me was like one of my rock gods. Same. She's the greatest. The best. She doesn't get enough shine. Yeah. Chrissy, the first two Pretenders records, for sure changed my life. Me too. Like, she is one of the most amazing artists in the world. Not like female artists. Like, she is artists. so dope. And she is so tough and so like, she's just like everything. She's like the spirit of rock and roll to me. And I'm absolutely obsessed with her. But like, she just looked like somebody who's tough who could just like out drink you at the bar. And like, we had these, these images and these idols. And now there's people like Tyler, the creator, like, and like T is somebody who like, just be like, yeah, like I don't do drugs and I don't drink. That shit is stupid. Billie Eilish. Billie's amazing. Yeah. And those are two people who, well, who I've um, had interactions with and I've had like the pleasure of, you know, conversations or connectivity. Right. So um, it's incredible that my kid and other kids out there have Billy as, as an example, because she's everything about her is incredibly positive and, and just like, she just does it. She just does it all so right. Like not only is she like one of the best like songwriters and singers of our generation, this generation, but she also like walks a tightrope like effortlessly and just, and, and Tyler too. Yeah. Tyler's the best example of what you said when you see something close to you in proximity, you know it's cap possible. Um, Tyler's a unicorn. Like I've known him since he was a teenager and I've watched what he's achieved and I'm old enough to be his dad. And whenever <laughs> I talk to him, I'm just like, I'm so impressed with you. Like I can't believe I'm inspired by him. And I'm like, oh, well, I can do this too because T does. And yeah. so I think kids nowadays, it's more like weed, shrooms, alcohol. Um, I think that like it's sad that we live in a world that like I have like um, Narcan in the back of my car, you know, or that like we have to educate people about fence and like test kits and stuff. And people are, it's only going to get worse because it's invaded all street drugs. And like... I think that kids are getting better, but to your original point about, is it getting better in the, like, in the sort of weird predatory creepy thing? Like my generation didn't have uh, accountability, right? My generation didn't have exam, like right. bad behavior, like not only like patriarchal stuff, but like sort of creep behavior, right? Pushy behavior, um, attitudes and not just actions. And like that misogyny was reinforced in every every movie we saw yeah like Celebrated. every every 80s movie is super like every like like the big the big movies like you watch 16 candles now you're like that's date rape yeah and it's racist <laughs> it's racist <laughs> it's sexist there's date rape there's homophobia it's insane so the idea that now that anyone has accountability whether it's for sexism for racism for um you know for homophobia for any of that stuff the accountability is really good and I think that's that the kids um, are in a good place because of it. Um, I also think that um, 
there's nothing worse than like someone older, like bemoaning council culture. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's usually the person who's like, probably needs to be canceled. Who's complaining about it. Totally. Yeah. I do think that like having some funny experiences with some of those people lately, Really. (laughs) just like, Oh, Holly, you're speaking out a lot about those times, those times. Right. And, and by the way, those are your experiences. That's your life. And you get to tell those stories. You get to write those sub stacks and those books and those films or whatever. And then yeah. sit here and tell your stories. Absolutely. So I'm so sad. We have to wrap this up. When are you going to make your film? <laughs> so, yeah. And so, what's going on? What's the latest? Yeah. What's yeah, the yeah. new record? Yeah. When are you making your film? So um, <laughs> she wants revenge is, is like this month finishing um, our new album. It's the first album we've done since 2011 so it's a long time coming that's amazing um we've been touring all over um the world really and we'll be doing some european dates u.s dates aren't really set right now um working on the record i'm working with a number of artists on the a and r creative direction label services management side and that's fun i get to help um artists because i have some amazing artists i get to work with right now um what else and i am working on two films in 2015 i wrote a film and i was like i'm really gonna do this like the band was like broken up on hiatus whatever and i was like i wrote a film basically started casting for it was like i'm gonna raise the money a friend of mine was like i have a fund let's make the movie we started casting we started moving forward it was amazing then it got like more steam and then i got signed with a big agency and got an amazing um literary and like filmmaking agent and then like you know like i had incredible actors attached and like all this stuff was going to happen and like the typical indie movie development like i have somebody from moonlight attached to be my lead oh my god they won the oscar this is amazing wait like you want you won't do the movie unless i cast like lily rose depp opposite like you know just like the hollywood politics kind of thing yeah up and down but like i never like complain or bemoan like because i'm in the game and i'm doing it and it's like it's part of the process it's like peaks and valleys so i've actually dusted off the script for that film that was in like five years of development and um there's somebody who's interested in revisiting it and so i'm doing a rewrite i'm really excited about and i'm really glad that i'm doing it now because it's a teen comedy Mm -hmm. and it's a coming of age movie and now that i actually have a real teenager it's changed the way i see it and so it's yeah. through fresh eyes and i'm working on a second film right now which is a um sci-fi action comedy that is like super transgressive and a combination of all the things i've ever loved in my life and i'm really excited about that so busy well shit, you heard it here stay tuned for everything justin warfield Where can we is find that him? your instagram handle yeah just I always go by my own name, yeah. Justin Warfield. Oh, I'm also putting out a solo record. I forgot about that. What? Yeah, yeah I kind of okay, buried the You are lead. busy. Yeah. <laughs> I recorded it during the pandemic. Under but, your name? Um, not under my name. Uh, it's called Forever Never Changes. Amazing. And um, when is that coming out? I think I'm gonna put it out. Um, I think I'm gonna do the first single in like March or April. That's really exciting. Yeah. I can't wait to hear it. I'm nervous. Dude. Not about the record, but I'm, I booked a show. Anyway. Can you say where? Yeah. I'm going to be playing, <laughs> um, I'm going to be playing Zebulon. <laughs> we're going to go. <clears throat> we're all, we're all going to go. Everybody. Um, <laughs> opening up for a friend of ours, incredible band called Escape Artist Lovers, who are doing a residency. Oh yeah. I know them. You know them. I know so them. Escape, I love it. I love them. Okay. And they're I'll be playing there every Monday in March. And I was like, you gotta let me open up for you. Oh my God, fuck so, yes, we're gonna, so we're all nervous. gonna go. Yeah. Justin, I'm so grateful to you for coming on and for being such a good friend. And I just adore you and thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for your time. Me, thank you. I just wanna, I just wanna, I just wanna get effed up and dance. Thanks for listening to The Hollywood Podcast. You can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Holly M. Solem and at hollywood.substack.com. H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-U-L-D dot substack.com. 
The Hollywood Podcast is filmed in Los Angeles, California, and produced by Christiana Ladke Williams. We'll be back next month with a brand new one for you. Please follow, like, download, share, and don't forget to leave a review. Say, say in my name. Let me tell you.